I'd like to just turn to introducing the panel members. We're very fortunate to have Alma Steingart and Stephanie Dick here, two of the rising stars in history of science, and Peter Gallison. Um, Alma Steingart is a lecturer in the Department of the History of Science at Harvard. Her research focuses on 20th century mathematical thought. Steingart is interested in the ways in which mathematical ways of thinking impact a wide range of disciplines, including the natural and social sciences and even the humanities. She is currently completing her first manuscript, Pure Abstraction, Mathematical Thought and High Modernism, which tracks the proliferation of mid-century mathematical thought dedicated to abstract and axiomatic ways of reasoning. She has also written widely on topics such as mathematical visualization and computer graphics. Steingart earned her PhD from MIT in the program in history, anthropology, science, and technology, and served as a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. Stephanie Dick is an assistant professor of history and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to that time, she was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. She completed her doctorate in 2015 at Harvard in the history of science. She is a historian of mathematics and computing in the in 20th century United States. In particular, her first project is a history of automated theorem proving that documents attempts to design and implement programs for mathematical theorem proving in the, the mid-20th century. <clears throat> Peter Gallison is the Joseph Pellegrino University professor at Harvard. He received his 1983 PhD from Harvard in theoretical high energy physics and in the history of science. In 1997, he was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. In 1998, the Pfizer Award for Image and Logic. In 1999, the Max Planck and Humboldt Stifting Prize. And in 2018, the Pais Prize in the History of Physics. His other books include How Experiments End, Einstein's Clocks, Poincaré's Maps, and Objectivity. Collaborating with Rob Moss, the two directed Secrecy, which premiered at Sundance and then containment in 2015 about the need to guard radioactive materials for the 10,000 year future. Gallison partnered with South African artist William Kentridge on a multi-screen installation, The Refusal of Time, 2012. He's a co-founder in 2016 of the Black Hole Initiative, an interdisciplinary center, which is the locus for his current philosophical and filming work. So I'd like to welcome the three panelists. And then I am going to just do a quick reading from Barry's book, uh, Imagining Numbers. I don't know if this is the origin of the phrase, the longest conversation. I think that actually came from a friend of yours, didn't it? But in any case, Barry says, the great glory of mathematics is its durative nature, that it is one of humankind's longest conversations that it never finishes by answering some questions and taking a bow. Rather, mathematics views its most cherished answers only as springboards to deeper questions. And I guess I would just start things off with the observation that if I can be simplistic and telegraphic, science grows through destruction and modification. Mathematics grows through accretion and reinterpretation. And so there's a difference between the history of mathematics and the history of science. Perhaps this is something we could explore. So we're going to have a conversation here. This is not the longest conversation. This is the, short, <laughs> this is the shortest conversation. It goes until 2.15, and I am the time dragon. Well, first, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. 
uh, as part of this uh, group of distinguished scholars and artists uh, who have been in long conversation with Barry for such a long time. Uh, and Barry might not know it, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, I started my conversation with Barry before I ever met him. Uh, I was gifted a copy of his book, uh, Imagining Numbers. Uh, and I really remember still kind of the, the vividness. How much, uh, I was struck by the ability of Barry to bring together uh, into a seamless conversation uh, poetry, literature, history, and mathematics. So I just want to say a quick word of what I find one of the most exceptional elements of Barry's writing about mathematics, which is, I think, his ability not to fall into what has been, I think, the two most dominant uh, approaches to writing about mathematics and its history. Uh, one of them I like to think, one approach I like to think about is um, frustrated isolationist. I think that people in that camp usually think about mathematics as something rarefied, really a kind of topic that's just available to a select few, and people write about mathematics from that camp, try to open it to the broader uh, audience and to broader conversation, while all along maintaining that mathematics is somewhat unique and uh, stands alone. Uh, on the other extreme, on the other camp, I think there are those um, who can think about naive universalists that argue that mathematics is everywhere, right? This notion that mathematics, if we just open our eyes, if we just become, realize it, uh, we will see mathematics everywhere, uh, the world, uh, the built environment around us. And I think what Barry does, which is remarkable, is actually being able to write in between these two extremes. Uh, he's able to write about mathematics and bring it into conversation with other intellectual pursuits. Uh, and he's able to do that without flattening mathematics into some sort of uh, empty signifier or some notion of mathematics existing there uh, without humans uh, being there uh, to imagine it to be human. And the way he does it is exactly uh, the way he does it in this book, uh, where by looking at ideas and topics such as imagination. Right? In the beginning of the book, uh, Barry has this moment that he asks the reader to come with him and think about kind of the faculty of imagination. He kind of asks you as the, as the reader to think about what it takes to imagine something. And I think once he does that, it's not a surprise that he brings into conversation poetry and mathematics and literature. And it's really a testimony to his vision that he's able uh, to do that. And I just want to say that as a historian of mathematics that had uh, somebody that has thought many, many hours, often many of them with Stephanie, I should say, about how to write a history of mathematics and how to write a history of mathematics that's interested to a broad audience. Uh, Barry's ability to kind of write uh, through cross-cutting themes and big questions while not forgetting kind of the details of the mathematics has been inspirational until now and I'm sure it's going to continue to be inspirational uh, uh, going forward. So I just want to say thank you for that. Well, I would also like to say it's just a profound and incredible honor and pleasure to be here. Barry has been one of the, the single most important interlocutors and mentors in uh, the 10 years that I spent at Harvard University and his uh, both encouragement and challenges and ideas and the way of approaching mathematical problem solving and question asking stays with me in ways that I won't be able to come close to articulating here today. So I also first encountered Barry through imagining numbers, um, but I got to meet the man alongside the book in a course that I was taking my very first year of graduate school that Peter was co-teaching with another Peter, uh, a philosopher by the name of Peter Gottfried Smith. And the project of the seminar was to explore something called the distributed cognition hypothesis. Uh, and the, the distributed cognition hypothesis asked the question of whether or not it actually makes sense to think of cognition as being bounded by skin and skull, or whether the ways that we think cognitive acts are in fact distributed, sometimes among people, sometimes between minds and certain technologies or physical apparatuses. The course asked us to take seriously the idea that the ways we think our cognitive capabilities might actually be a function of social and material and technological contexts as opposed to just the uploading and downloading of things into the mind and out of it. And we read Barry's book in the context of that seminar and it was such a perfect fit with our set of questions because in it Barry proposes this notion of the collective imagination in mathematics where not just 
the ideas that are important or significant for mathematical work, but the very conditions of possibility for certain forms of imagination and with it intuition in mathematical work are a function of what communities or histories do together and are in no simple way just the sum of the parts of a community, but that intuition might be an emergent property both of communities or of histories. And I thought that was such a profound idea and I am quite convinced that 20th century knowledge, perhaps in particular, demands of us that we think about cognition not as seated in the heads of individual people, but as something that is made possible by practices, by methods, by the visions and the collective work of communities over time. Um, and in the book project I'm working on, uh, that is perhaps the single most primary question. I'm interested in how new forms of intuition and imagination about mathematical work emerge as a function of interaction with computing machinery. Uh, and I was profoundly honored to have Barry sit on my dissertation committee and constantly be pushing me to ask questions around that theme. Uh, and it would be um, impossible to overstate how much every meeting with him redirected and reshaped the conversations I was having with myself precisely because every meeting with him was a conversation about history, about poetry, about literature, about intuition, about big data, about machine learning, about statistics, about everything. I've never known a person who was so able and willing and interested uh, to talk even with young graduate students about anything under the sun that helps them to pull their thoughts together. So it's really a pleasure to be here and be a part of this conversation and to be a part of conversation with Barry. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to see uh, how Barry's influence has continued across the years to two of my favorite historians of mathematics. Uh, Barry had a huge impact on me as when I first came to Harvard as a uh, undergraduate. I, I had spent a year at École Polytechnique in France before I, I went to college. And I studied, I was working in a physics lab, but I was studying with a mathematician, a great mathematician, Lauren Schwartz, and, who took, taught a course on distributions and convolutions, which I enjoyed. But I made mistakes right from the beginning. The first mistake, well, first of all, I didn't look like the other students. I had hair down to my shoulders and a headband. They were in the military, so the students were all <laughs> properly attired uh, in military form. And um, so I raised my hand to ask questions. And I, people explained to me, you, you don't. You don't ask questions. Yeah, so I said, OK. Well, then obviously the next thing I'll do is I'll go ask questions to him in his office. And then someone explained to me, you don't go to the office. <laughs> so he was actually very nice to me when I went. I had a very nice conversation with him. But uh, I learned the lesson. So I, then there was travaux pratique, the sections. And so I went to the section, you know, raise my hand, I have a question. And someone said to me, no, no, you, 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 you don't ask questions in the travaux pratique. So I said, so where do you ask questions? And they said, you don't. <laughs> so at the, at the travaux pratique, there was a guy, sort of a bureaucratic queeg, who sat there with his pencil like this. And he, you know, he would say, garçon au tableau, résolve la question suivante. And he would write on the board. And so you answered his questions, but he didn't. So when I got to Harvard, I was a little math traumatized. But um, <laughs> there was a course that swept people up called Math 55, and I took that. Uh, it was very fun. Lots of interesting people who've gone on to do interesting things, like uh, Steve Ga uh, Ga Ga Gates. And um, we had a great time. And then I went to see like, what to do next. And that's when I met Barry. And he said, well, you know, come to my course on complex analysis. So this was uh, 43 years ago. And uh, I went to his course. And I loved it. I mean, I, you know, I think when we talk about the longest conversation of mathematics, and narrative in science. In a way, Barry combines narration and storytelling with a conversation. It's not just performative where you ignore who you're talking to. As, as, as both Stephanie and Alma have said, he, he really engages. And I and colleagues profit from this every week at the Society of Fellows when we have something we want to know about mathematics or a mathematician's work. Um, Barry will momentarily look up as if to begin a story, and then he tells a story about the mathematics that uh, is completely riveting to everybody, whether they're from English or history or art history or 
uh, the other sciences, biology, physics. So that continues. And I, I love the, 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 the sort of, in these stories are the motivation and the appeal of mathematical reasoning, the, a sense of why you would want to reason this way. Um, and they're not so uh, crystalline formed that you feel shut out from them. You, 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 you know, he, he will address you whether you're a student in a graduate course on complex analysis or a, a colleague asking about something that's going on, a response that shows you why he cares about it or why we should care about it or how we can join him in caring about them. And I think that, that it, both, both Stephanie and Alma have, have mentioned this, but the diversity of interests that I see in Barry, uh, the way he thinks about things, is not just a collection of isolated bits. They're actually, for him, very organically connected. And the interest in narration and the narrative structure of mathematics, the, na the narrative quality of how he teaches, the way he's interested in the narrative structure of literary or philosophical arguments, it's really of a piece. It's telling a motivated story that's propelled through ideas to the next thing. And conveying that sense of an impelled movement is, is I think, an enormous privilege for all of us who have been in a conversation with Barry uh, over these years. So I have a question for you both. Uh, <laughs> watch a conversation. How, how do you, I mean, in a way, uh, both of you have been interested in mathematics not only as a conversation in, in, among mathematicians, but between and among mathematicians and others, whether they're computer scientists or, form, you know, doing, or formal proofs or machine learning or collectivities of people, and both of you are interested in how the collective uh, accomplishment uh, works. How do you see the history of math as a, as a conversation with both in, you know, as a hub, as well, with spokes, as well as uh, its, own, its own intrinsic uh, historical conversation in your own work. I mean, start there. I, I mean, I'm happy to start. I think this is kind of one of the most interesting questions that for historian mathematics is exactly how to be able to write history of mathematics uh, that sees mathematics in conversation with other fields. Uh, I can say that for me, part of my interest right now uh, lately has been a lot about the kind of rise of axiomatic thinking. And what's interesting, uh, if you, what I realize, if you look at the history of mathematics, not, and I think uh, Mark actually already noted that in the remarks that you read by Mark, uh, if you think about mathematics not just a collection of theorems, but as a, a thought processes, as practices, it allows you to tell a much richer history of mathematics. Uh, and if, for example, uh, in my work, I look at uh, the use of uh, the kind of rise of axiomatics thinking. And if you just turn to that, you realize that the same modes of reasoning, the way of thinking mathematically, uh, specifically axiomatic thinking, uh, was then taking out in the 1950s. You can find both social scientists, uh, psychologists calling for incorporating axiomatic thinking into psychology, or you can find actually architects uh, saying that we need to take axiomatic thinking and uh, be influenced by modern mathematics. So there's a way in which it's all about how do you think about mathematics itself and how do you approach the field itself uh, as not just a collection of theories that are timeless, uh, but as modes of reasoning, as a way of thinking uh, that are very much embedded in the world. Um, but to me, being a way of kind of getting at this question, exactly this question. Um. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a sort of tragic way to frame most of the work that I am doing, which is as being about the sort of breakdown or failure of communication between mathematicians and a different community of practitioners. So the people that I study are really keen on taking advantage of the profound power and speed and efficacy at working with formal systems that modern digital computers offer in order to try to introduce them to the work of mathematical research or to the act of mathematical theorem proving. Uh, and, and they can be quite good at it. Um, computer proofs or computers have made possible some very challenging and powerful mechanisms for theorem proving, and yet often mathematicians have not been very interested in this work. 
1983, the American Mathematical Society tried really hard to get working research mathematicians in conversation with people doing automated theorem proving work, uh, and it, it didn't really go anywhere. And one of the reasons for that is that mathematicians are interested in so much more than whether or not a given statement is true. Uh, they care a great deal more about the kinds of insights that a mathematical proof can provide, but only if you can read it, <laughs> only if you can understand it, only if it is surveyable. Uh, proofs do a lot more than just certify the truth of something for mathematicians. And so a lot of the automated theorem proving work, especially in the second half of the 20th century that's been done, sort of failed to start an engaging conversation between mathematicians and computer scientists. And part of what I've been trying to explain and explore is what is it that mathematicians want from a proof? And the answer is all kinds of things. Proofs offer up new methods for thinking about objects or behaviors. They give new insights into the relationships between different fields. They offer new possibilities or analogies between kinds of problem solving or kinds of artifacts or objects in mathematics. Uh, and so in a certain sense, um, part of what this project has been about, and one of the questions Barry has been so helpful in his approach to the history of mathematics has been so enlightening about, is that mathematics, as Mark said, is not just about theorem proving, and it's not just about collecting theorems. It's also about all the forms of intuition and imagination and practice that come along with exploring mathematical domains. So that's an anti-answer to your question. Um, but I have found that looking at the ways that mathematics interfaces with other disciplines that might seek to make contributions to it, um, sometimes they don't actually have on offer what mathematicians are looking for, um, which is an interesting way to think about the problem. Um, Do you think we'll ever get there? <laughs> Maybe. I'm a historian, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I did. I wish I did. Interesting things are happening now, but um, the story of the 20th century is almost a story of sort of missed interests, I think. Well, both of you mentioned uh, imagination, and it's in the title of, of Barry's book. Um, how, how do you think about imagination uh, within, a histor within the historical frame of things that you study on. So I have a good story about Barry, actually, about imagination. So uh, a few years ago, I became, I became interested uh, in the way in which, it's a question about imagination in, in mathematics, and I became interested in the way in which mathematicians imagine higher dimensional spaces. Uh, it's, it was something that was fascinating me. And I ended up writing a paper about the way uh, some mathematicians that ended up using computer graphics in order to imagine higher dimensional spaces. And I, I had Barry read the paper, and after Barry read the paper, he got back to me with comments, and one of his comments, he said, uh, I, I have an idea for you, I have a suggestion, I think what you need to do is you need to try and imagine one of something, a higher dimensional space that not, doesn't come easily to you, uh, and then you need to describe it. Now, what Barry didn't realize is that the reason I became so interested in that is because I utterly failed in trying to imagine higher dimensional space. I had no ability to do that, right? Uh, but I think this is kind of, uh, but I, I still took Barry's idea, of the idea that I need to try and imagine uh, a higher dimensional space, and then he wanted, what, he, what he asked is for me to be able to write uh, and describe kind of the texture of what's this, what went in my mind, what's the kind of texture of this imagination. And I, don't, I, I failed in this case <laughs> when it comes to trying to, to imagine higher dimensional space, uh, but I think that as when I write about mathematics and when I try to describe some sort of mathematical problems in my own writing, I do take this advice about imagining for myself and trying to imagine as a, um, as a way to start a process of writing itself. Uh, and so it's both, what I like about it is both the historical question, how in different times a uh, mathematician went about imagining, uh, and here comes, I look at computer graphics, so how did it change, how, what's the possibilities of imagining geometry changed with the introduction of new technology? but also as a way of thinking about writing about the history of mathematics. So both it's an historical question, but it's also, I take, I took kind of, that's what I took very to, to, to say, I hope that was part of what you are uh, saying at the time, uh, as something that I should think about uh, for writing about the, kind of for myself, writing about the history of mathematics. 
Uh, but I think it's, it's, you have to think about this question of imagining, uh, not just, I think geometry allow, allows it uh, more easily to this question of imagining, but if you take Barry's work, uh, just imagining the square root of the number of minus 15 requires sort of imagining itself. Uh, so it's always there. What do you think, Stephanie? Do you think that as imagination changed, it's, it's how we understand it or how it's understood in the community of mathematicians, applied mathematicians over the period you've looked at in the last 100, 100 120 years? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there are sort of two camps of people working with computers on this question of intuition or imagination or the creativity that is required to do especially higher mathematical problem solving or theorem proving. Uh, there's the one camp who says, oh, we can automate that. <laughs> Everything mathematicians do, all their shorthands, all their exploratory techniques, we can represent them as heuristics that can in turn be automated. There's a camp who truly believes that what might feel esoteric or uh, irreducible or unformalizable even to mathematical practitioners could, with the right knowledge engineer, be elicited, formalized, and automated, if not now, then in the near future. And there's another camp of people who hold imagination, creativity, intuition, certain human mathematical faculties, they hold them apart and say, well, whatever computers are going to offer to mathematics, it can't be those things. They are unautomatable. They are um, uniquely human in some way. Uh, and what I've been really interested in is what happens to the idea of what imagination or intuition, they're not the same thing, but they often get grouped together by these people, what happens to them when they're actually making these computer programs. And what struck me as really interesting is that even for those who wanted to cordon off imagination or imaginative acts or intuitions as something uniquely human, they still get translated in a certain way into a language that the computer can understand. So for example, there's one group I've been very interested in studying who wanted to build collaborative theorem proving programs that would take human intuitions as inputs to guide them on their merely deductive and merely mechanical search for a proof within some formal space. Uh, but in order to make human intuitions useful to a machine, they turn them into a waiting mechanism. <laughs> so at different runs during the computer program, you input a waiting template that says something like, short clauses are preferable to longer ones, or multiplication is more important than division, or this operation should be you know, um, uh, executed before this operation. So they take this beautiful sort of folk psychological Jacques Ademar inspired notion of human intuition and they turn it into a waiting mechanism that gets you know, input by punch card to a computer program. Um, so the, the history of intuition is tied up with surprising practices or constraints or ideas sometimes. And I have no idea how to write the history of subjective experience. Peter has a book on objectivity. We are all awaiting the book on subjectivity. Um, Alma and I have been talking about this for 10 years, what it would look like actually to try to write a history of human intuition. And Barry's book is probably the closest thing that we have to it. Um, and so most of what I have to say on this subject is about the way that the people I study try to define and then work with different formulations of intuitive or imaginative ideas in mathematics, which ends up looking uh, quite surprising sometimes. You know, it's interesting, imagination has had such a uh, ambivalent relation to the arts, the sciences, mathematics. I mean, it's it, 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 philosophically, it, for a, lot, a long part of its history, imagination was considered to be a bad thing. And either bad because it was a mere recombination of things as opposed to a deeper working out of structures that underlay them. Uh, certainly in, in literary and literary philosophical circles in the 19th century, there was a, was a fairly common view. Um, but it was also something that, was, that psychologists thought of as being a valuable and measurable property. I mean, before Rorschach, when people looked at inkblot tests, you had specific, there were specific tests that you had for each of the faculties. There was a test for how quickly you could calculate and how many numbers you could remember. Could you, rem you know, remember one, two, seven, four, three? Could you imagine one, two, seven, four, three, five, seven, six? And 
and so on, and then you, and, but each of the, in the faculty conception of mind, each of these had a specific test. The test for the specific faculty of imagination was how many images, how many things you could see in an inkblot. So you would hand somebody an inkblot, and there would be a bell, and you would say, you know, cow, light, bottle, table, and uh, then you would have to show where you saw those, and the more, the merrier. So um, when Rorschach began his work in the early 20th century, uh, he, he, he found that people would say, oh, you know, this is a test of the imagination. And for Rorschach, it wasn't at all, he didn't care at all about the imagination. He didn't believe in the faculty concept of mind to begin with. He said this was a test of perception. What are the characteristic modes by which we come to the world? Uh, do we emphasize blank spaces? Do we look at shades of color? Do we emphasize color above form or form above color? And he used that to try to give a kind of set of coefficients, so to speak, of our perceptual tuning, what we brought in and what we left out in our encounter with the world. And, but he said, because everyone believes that it's a test of the imagination, it's a useful fiction to let people come in. So he, he, people were taught to, set, to not contradict the patient or the examinee when they came in and said, is this a test of the imagination? You were supposed to say, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it had nothing to do with that. And so you know, it's been some, he devalued that. I mean, he did, I mean, he, so I, I think that there's an, it's interesting to think you know, to what extent imagination is, is tied to images, to what extent is it a poor cousin to real poetical or literary or philosophical creativity, to what extent is it the triumphant characteristic of the a faculty of being able to see, to what extent does it have nothing to do, like the square root of minus 15, with sight or imagined or recalled or recombined sight at all. Um, and, and in that sense, I think it's a dynamical category that, like intuition, there's nothing intuitive about intuition, right? It's, it's not, there's nothing simple about simplicity, and there's not, <laughs> the imagination has, its, has, has a shifting set of allegiances, friends and enemies. I think there's also a gender story to imagination, right? Yes. I mean, if you look, right, if you think about uh, Edna Lovelace, there's a good example, but I like to think about her, right? She was, uh, at her time, uh, there, she was told that she, kind of, she, would, she would never be successful because she would, she was going to let her imagination run free, and she was, she was too imaginative, but that was kind of the, the what she was uh, told, that this is what she would, she had to, uh, she had to study mathematics as a way of, the idea was that she would study mathematics as a way of kind of taming it down her imagination to, to correct. So there's also kind of very much a gender uh, component to how we think about this idea of imagination and logic, mm -hmm. and, which is part of this history uh, when we think about it, as a, like you said, as a shifting, uh, historically shifting category, in fact. And maybe the same could be said for all of these hierarchies of human faculties we would like to build up. Um, we have a colleague, Lorraine Dastin, who has this wonderful article about the act of calculating large numbers in the Enlightenment. And there was once a time when the ability to do large calculations or to work in your mind with big numbers was associated with virtuosic mathematical genius. But as soon as there were machines that came along or were invented that could take on the act of working with large numbers, that kind of mental work became merely mechanical. Uh, and mathematical genius and virtuosic mathematical thinking became associated with other capacities quite independent of sort of arithmetic or working with large numbers. But it was around that exact same time that human calculators, primarily women, started taking on low-paid, low-skilled labor as calculators, as calculating machines or human computers. So there's always a story being told about whose capacities and whose faculties are being valued, whose are being devalued, and how the, the work of mathematical labor gets distributed across different communities of people and people and technologies. The same is true actually in automated theorem proving. Um, the anthropomorphic language that the people I study use to talk about the kind of work they think a computer will be able to do is incredibly telling. 
So some people, those same people who think all of your faculties are, at least in principle, automatable, talk about computers as being colleagues or mentors or co-workers. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, though, are those who talk about the work of computers as being assistants or servants or slaves. And by using anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic language of this kind, they reinforce ideas about what kind of mathematical labor is valuable, what kind of mathematical labor is not valuable, and they redraw these lines between what is uniquely human and impressive and what is merely mechanical, and therefore a woman could do it, or a machine could do it, or, you know. <laughs> so it's a fraught history, this imagination or creativity history, maybe. So I remember in the, in the chess playing community a few years ago, <clears throat> there was this term chimera, and the idea was that uh, a chess player would become sort of amalgamated in some sense with a chess engine. Could this, I mean, do you see much of this in the world of, of mathematics over the last few years in, in terms of automated theory of proof? Um, I'm not sure. I'd need to know a bit more about what they have in mind, I think. I think the idea is that the, the machine and the human are sort of greater than the sum of their parts. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of synergy there. Yeah, I think some people would want to say that, that there will be modes of reasoning or forms of problem solving that are emergent properties of different relationships between the people and the technology, but I still don't quite know what it looks like in practice or what they think it would look like in practice. Um, but yes, definitely, that they will be more than mere extensions of our faculties but rather create new forms of intuiting or thinking is something that lots of people are at least in principle excited about. What? About the chess players? <laughs> <laughs> or, or human machine. Human machines. Amalgamations. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, the history of, I, mean, we, I think we talked about it a lot in the past, but the, like the history of human machine, when it comes, for example, the chess is a good example, right? So chess used to be, when you think about uh, chess playing used to con was considered to be that's when machines will become intelligent, when machines will be able to win in chess. And of course, once that happened, uh, kind of the bar was raised. That no longer was considered to be the, the ultimate test case. So then the game Go became the new kind of, you know, the way we are going to measure. When, and then when we got there, so there's a way in which uh, this is a constantly, again, it's a constantly moving construct of how we're going to think about what counts as intelligence and, and this, this sort of kind of what faculties are machines and humans can develop together. Uh, and of course, uh, with the game, with, a, with a, the recent one, with the game Go, part of the argument was that it wasn't really intelligent because it didn't mimic what, how a human would go about reasoning, uh, how, how a human would go about reasoning about the game Go. That was kind of one of the main uh, thing that uh, people were left with the game. So I think there's a way in which, uh, as the sort of um, human machine um, boundaries are going to continually be uh, drawn and redrawn, this question about the faculties of reasoning, faculties of intuition, I think that's what Stephanie's work shows that for the earliest period, exactly that. But this is Right. If, if what, what you show for their period is most likely going to continue, uh, can continue to play out and continues to play out uh, today as well. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of a debate that happened in physics where the, between CERN and Berkeley in the 60s, and the CERN folks, there were all these millions of bubble chamber pictures coming out of the apparatus, I mean, literally millions, of, tens of millions sometimes. And so people would sit there at scanning tables and code, code these images into a form that the computer could process. And the, the, the Europeans said, this is terrible. This is a kind of Dickensian workshop where all these people are consigned to doing this routine work. How can we avoid that? We have to solve the pattern recognition problem in general and liberate all these people from their light tables and projectors and computers. And Alvarez said, no, no, no. Here's the problem. People are good at some things, and they're not good at some things. They're good at sort of seeing an emergent pattern or something unusual that doesn't fit a pattern, and they're terrible at routine tasks of calculation 
and not making arithmetical errors and transcribing. So get the machines to do the things that are good for machines to do, and then leave the scanners to do the things that they're specially good at. And so they started to train the scanners to be, um, in a way, like a doctor who studies routine uh, pictures of skulls until you see one that you say that's not normal, that's pathological, that's a tumor. And only in the case of bubble chamber and other images it was, that's not normal, that's a discovery. So <laughs> the valuation was <laughs> very different from being catastrophic to being good, but it was, it was somehow distinguishing between the routine and the, and the exceptional uh, in images. And, but as, of course, the, these techniques have changed in different areas, classifying stars was something computers could do and by their spectra, and now computers can do that pretty well. So, you know, pattern recognition is itself constantly changing, and so uh, the, the, the separation line between the things that computers do and the place where we humans are useful uh, is a moving point of separation. So the, the chimera, in a sense, is an amalgamation, a, a cyborg of changing partition. Yeah. I don't know how so chess I, players think about this. Well, I think they do, yeah. I, I think, now, I think it may have evolved beyond that to the point where, you know, I think many chess players now would say that their, their training as a chess player abs is absolutely dependent upon their computer partner. Will that ever become the case with mathematicians? I have no idea. But the chess players don't feel like they're done for. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is a question. I mean, I think actually, I talked about it, about it with Barry a long time ago. So when computers were introduced, originally, most mathematicians were uh, very much against the idea of using computers in, uh, in mathematics. And I think uh, today, most, to, I think that most mathematicians end up using mathematicians, with computers in the work, various, various numbers, so, right. so, so I, I know I'm right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think there's also a certain kind of uh, what's the community standards uh, are changing as well. Uh, and part of it is exactly figuring out uh, to what degree are computers, to what degree and to what end computers are being used. Uh, it's not to replace, but uh, it's, uh, you know, we talked about the use of experimental mathematics or as a way of kind of bringing our conjectures. So. What happens with Hilbert is exactly what loses its meaning as a, it's a terminological root. So it means a self-evident truth, and then the question of intuition and imagination comes very easily. But with Hilbert, it's exactly the point that an axiom is arbitrary, right? If you follow Hilbert's model for geometry, the, 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 it's by definition an axiom has to be arbitrary. Uh, it's no longer something that's a self-evident truth. Um, and I think, though, uh, so you, you can kind of tell the story and the story is partly being told as kind of the where, way in which intuition moves out of mathematics. That with this rise of formal systems, uh, intuition kind of falls out of fashion. I think this is a, I don't want to say it wrong, but it's a one way of telling a story or a simplistic way of telling a story because if you read, even if you take Borbach Key, which are considered to be uh, kind of the, the, the best example of taking the modern axiomatic. Uh, in the kind of formal work of Hilbert, they still talk about intuition because you, as they talk about as a mathematician, you have intuition to the kind of objects that you, you kind of build intuition during your studies for the objects that you are studying yourself. So what you mean by the word intuition ends up changing in this new, uh, it's no longer meant this kind of self-evident truth is what's intuition. But I think, I think that I even, I mean, you talked about it, as a mathematician, if you're working on a certain problem, part of working on a problem is building a certain kind of intuition for the material that you're studying. So, so part of it is exactly trying to be careful of what we mean when we talk about the word intuition, how we, how we use it. Uh, and to say that when we use it, when we talk about uh, axiomatic in a kind of Euclidean way, and when we talk about axiomatic uh, in a Hilbert way, we, we actually mean, maybe meaning two different things uh, in part. Uh, 
uh, and the world imagination itself could uh, uh, move. But I mean, the, the work, if you think about the work of um, Mertens that, that kind of wrote about the, you know, the change in mathematics at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, for him the big, kind of the big divide was the logic, the kind of logic and the intuition, right? And that used to be the big divide, I think, uh, the way to tell kind of the break in the history of mathematics. Um, I think that the break, uh, a more interesting break that happens in the 50s, if you look at the way mathematicians talk about two kinds of mathematical minds, uh, it's about the theory builder and the problem solver. So you take Erdos as being the problem solver, and then you have people that are theory builders. It's a different way of thinking about intuition, of really thinking about kind of faculties of mind that coming into mathematical, uh, kind of part of the mathematical uh, practice and mathematical creation. Do you think that that's coincident with sort of algebraic and geometrical, or do you think that that's a separate? I think that might be just another dichotomy to add to this list that Ulm is constructing of moments in history of mathematics where mathematical communities are defining themselves in opposition to one another. And in the 19th century, there's an opposition between those who believe that the correct set of tools and mode of thinking with which to do geometry is diagrammatic or it's tied to physical models. It's about that kind of knowledge and synthetic intuition and those who believe that the new algebra is the right way to solve geometric problems. That I think uh, I wouldn't want to reduce that dichotomy to the others, but we could add it to the list. Um, we could add it to the list. What strikes me in some of those early 20th century discussions is that both the anti-imagistic and the imagistic schools, they both recognize the, the, the extraordinary power that these images afford. But the anti-imagistic people sometimes think that it's too powerful, exactly. that it leads us astray, like the iconophilic uh, dangers of, 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 of the icon in theological thought, right? That it, it, it's supposed to be a step to something else, a deeper understanding, perhaps, or a deeper knowledge of God in the theological domain. The danger is that it ends up being an object in its own right, and that, Joseph Kerner, who I see back there, has taught me uh, long ago is that iconoclasts are always iconoclastic about something. They're not iconoclastic in general. And so uh, it's which images they want to break. And um, I think in science and mathematics, that's true too. It's like, what are you worried about? And I mean, Poincaré taught, it makes a distinction between people who think in an algebraic formal way versus those in a, in a in a more geometrical, intuitive way, uh, he's not. Dis he, you know, he, he has something specific in mind, and he, he thinks that the um, his worry is that people give up too easily on the power that the images hold. But it's, it, I, my feeling about Poincaré is he often thinks it's like a carpenter saying, you know, hey, I could build a house without a hammer. And Poincaré, why would you do that? I mean, that's just crazy talk. I mean, of course you could use a rock to knock your nails in, but a hammer is specially made for just that job. Why would you give it up? And you know, when he talks about uh, geometrical intuition or about the ether in physics, it's not because he, he's not an idiot. He doesn't think that there's an ether blowing in the, you know, by, by 1904 or five. He's, he's quite clear on that, but he thinks it leads to all sorts of things, right? Maxwell thought, Maxwell discovered the displacement current and, and electric waves because he was reasoning about something he thought was the ether. And, you know, then he goes on and he has another formulation where he doesn't use that at all. But it's a helpful way of moving. The objectors say it's too helpful. It will blind you to relations and structures if you're too fixed on it. Like, you, you know, you think you know parallel lines are defined by railroad tracks? Well, you know, you're going to miss out on a, a lot of the mathematical adventure that awaits. I mean, Hilbert is great for that, right? because on the one hand, he's celebrated as exactly this kind of formalist. On the other hand, he has geometry in the imagination, which is full of images, and it is, it's, it's not, um, it, it absolutely acknowledged that, like you said, that there, there is a place for images. But for him, right, for Hilbert, it's the, the, there's no place in the foundation of mathematics. When you, when you go to put mathematics on kind of certain base, then there is no place for him for images. Then, at that, at that place, um, it's logic and not the kind of formal system and not, and not images. Uh, so, you know, the flip side of, of 
of, of rigor in some ways is well-definedness. They're not exactly the same thing. And a lot of times the discussions, uh, at least at the boundary with physics, and when, when mathematicians are really annoyed at physicists, it's not, it's not just, it's not even mainly, I think, about rigor. It's that they, 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 they say, although of course we all say, I don't know what you're talking about, we say that all the time, but I think for mathematicians, it's often a case that they really look at the physicists and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, what, what, what role does, you know, historically do you, do you see, in, as you look in your different but related domains of the history of mathematics, what role does well-definedness play as a historical concept? I mean, the advent of automation has sort of reanimated a quite old debate between those who believe that a proof is something that convinces mathematicians that something is the case, and those that believe that a proof is a fully formalized and complete step-by-step -step demonstration that something is the case within a sort of formal system. And uh, computers are actually quite good at formalization. They're good at well-definedness. They're good at following the rules in a sequential order. They can only do uh, sort of complete and fully formalized mathematical work, which it turns out human mathematicians are not very well equipped nor particularly interested in doing. Um, but then there are those, as I've already discussed a little bit, who think that proofs are about more than a fully formalized and complete enumeration of the deductive steps that establish that something is the case in mathematics. Um, and that's a story that's been written about quite a lot. But what actually interested me more when I looked at this history was what actually happened to what formalization meant. Uh, it turned out that whole new ways of formalizing were also being developed by the people who wanted to introduce computers to the work of theorem proving. And some of the new ways of formalizing, the new formal systems that were designed to help computers work in mathematics, uh, were quite different in precisely this way in that they removed uh, human psychology from the equation. So there was famously a classicist by the name of John Allen Robinson who, working in 1965, said, all of our logical formalisms until now have been oriented around trying to have a, a single step of deduction or inference be clear to a human mind, that how you get from one step to the next step is something that we can understand and follow. It adapt we have adapted formalism to human psychology but maybe now that we have these extremely powerful logical machines on the table, we might develop whole new logics built with different formal tools that are not so accommodated to what is clear to us in a single deductive step. So in that moment in the middle of the 1960s, there emerged this field of study called computer-oriented logics, which were about building perfectly logically sound and very powerful formal systems but that displaced human understanding from the equation of what formalization looked like. Uh, and so this was a moment again where two different ideas about what ought, to, what ought to count as a proof for what good mathematical demonstrations looked like are on the table like they have been for so many other moments in history. But at the heart of this conversation was a question of what does it even mean to work with a formal system? What should a formal system look like? And need it be bound to us in some way? Uh, and sometimes the answer was no, but often the demonstrations produced by those computer systems, they were fully formalized, they were sometimes very powerful, but they produced these demonstrations that aren't just unintelligible because they're too long, but because they are built through the execution of formal steps that are not so easy for us to identify as a reasonable, logical step. So what formalization means and how it is done and how it relates to our understanding uh, is also one of the things that's on the table in the conversation about automation. This is sort of the black box problem of AI, isn't it? It is exactly that, yes. <laughs> yeah. The AI does not know how to explain what it just did. That's right, nor is it usually asked to. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I think the European <laughs> Union wants to ask. The European <laughs> Union wants that, so do I. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you want to? No, I, I mean, I think, it, I think it's, question of, it's a, the question of definition of all time. It's exactly this, uh, where you see it is, uh, it's exactly in this boundary work. It's when mathematician and physicist uh, 
come together and to agree. So there's a way in which uh, I, I, I was thinking, um, can, I, can we think about a case of well defined <coughs> that stays within the mathematical community? Mm -hmm. so, so when you don't talk among, across communities. I think this question of standards, maybe it's not quite this question of like, well defined, the question of standards are still within uh, specialties, within within kind of communities of specialists uh, within mathematics. I mean, you know, I've done the work, I've done a little bit of work on the kind of classification of fundamental groups, and within the community it was very much agreed what counts as uh, a standard, but it doesn't mean that people outside that <coughs> core group of uh, mathematicians necessarily agree. So uh, it's exactly in these places that the kind of boundaries between different communities that you see that. Um, uh, but I, I don't have other good example within kind of mathematics when you see that. I don't know, physics and mathematics. I'd like to go back to Mark's statement here. He says, the history of math is not just the story of what was proved and how, but also includes the question of what was believed and why. And it seems to me that we've been talking a great deal about intuition. If I'm working on a problem, I develop a great deal of intuition about that problem. I begin to somehow believe that this is true, and that motivates me to try to find a proof. Perhaps without that belief, which follows intuition, that never happens. Computers don't believe things. They just do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a powerful thing. Barry, you shared an anecdote with me about communities of mathematicians who believe something is true in the face of all empirical evidence to the contrary. And that's a really powerful thing that speaks to the degree to which even when mathematicians make use of what look like empirical practices, like looking, using computer-generated data about what happens way out there in the number line, or experimenting with cases on the page, or there are lots of empirical practices that go into mathematical problem solving or the cultivation of mathematical knowledge, but you know, it is not reducible to that, it seems. If you can believe something contrary to all of the evidence, that has to be a big part of how paths are drawn through mathematical knowledge production, I guess, making. Yeah. I mean, there's also the point of you have to believe something in order to go about trying to prove it to begin with, right? I mean, it's kind of the first act, it seems, this place of, like you said, right? It's the place of, in order to begin, you know, choose a topic and go after it. You have to have some sort of belief mm -hmm. it's possible. As, as a human being. As a human. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Unless your advisor told you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if your advisor's human. <laughs> I mean, with AI, it's interesting because when I, I recently I've been, I've been looking at the way that image making takes place when you have sparse data. You know, from astronomy or from other domains. And you have to assume something to begin to form the image if the image is sparse. It's like, what kind of line are you going to draw? You have a bunch of points. You want to, you say, what's the best line to it? Well, you tell me it's straight, I can find which straight linear feature goes through it. Or if, I, if it's a circle, I can find the best circle. But you can't just say, what's the best without any kind of prior. And so, um, that's been something that's been much debated, and but then it worries the people in the community of astronomers because it feels, as they say, subjective. And you know, what what are you going to put in? Do you think it's a prior assumption that it's maximum entropy, minimum information? Do you think it's going to be um, one of and then, you know, another set of functions that you something circular, symmetric, or you have to put in something. And so they said, well, let's, let's see if we can get AI to look at these putative galaxies or classify galaxies or do something else. And so they, they, they said, this is great. This is going to get rid of our subjectivity. So then the computer does it. And then they say, but how did the, you know, what's the computer, what's the computer done? Well, they, they won't tell you. So, I mean, and if you're, you know, if you're Netflix or Google or, you know, it's fine, you know, Amazon doesn't care whether they can interrogate their machine and find out why if you like this, you should buy that, as long as you buy it. 
And so uh, that, that may not be satisfactory to, 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 to the scientists confronting me. And that, so I looked up the papers by the machine learning community, and they say these amazing things. They say, at this point, the machine began to hallucinate. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's enhancing some you know, zebrafish and it's put stripes where there are no stripes on the zebrafish. So, or another, another group uh, said, well, we don't know why it did this. The machine seems to be learning to do some wrong thing. And so what, what's fascinating to me is that in this huge community, billions of dollars are being spent on machine vision for all sorts of reasons, no. And is that it's taken, it, moving to AI, at least in some of these scientific domains, was out of a fear of subjectivity. And then what they've done is they've gotten a machine that they ascribe subjectivity to, <laughs> and the machine won't answer any questions. So it's like worse than, <laughs> worse than having it, you know, one of your colleagues who say, well, I think the prior should be maximum entropy because you know, I really think we should assume the minimum about the world around us. And you can have an argument with your colleague. The computer is not going to say anything. So, uh, but I thought, I thought that was very interesting. And it seems to occur over and over again, because machine vision is in self-driving cars, and classification, and face recognition, and all sorts of things. Yeah. Well, I believe that there's legislation before the European Union that, that wants to establish a criterion for Explanatory yeah. behavior. The, the, is that, am I right about that? Yeah. The question. The question is. Is the question of interpretability is the technical term. So most most models in machine learning they operate as a function of some like crazy huge number of parameters, but it's impossible to unpack how any given parameter contributes to the behavior of the overall system or model. Um, interpretable, you can force a model to be interpretable so that we can look at the relationships between parameters and the overall behavior of the model that comes out, but you forfeit a little bit of predictive accuracy when you do that. Uh, and so the question is whether we should forfeit predictive accuracy and have interpretable models, and the answer tends to be depends on what the problem domain is. So if it's criminal risk assessment scores being used in courts to predict whether or not a given defendant will reoffend or commit a violent crime or show up for their bail here or for their trial, um, the answer might be yes, because they have a right to know their accuser. And if this number is being generated by a non-interpretable machine learning system, perhaps that right has been violated in some way. Um, the other answer, if you know, you're trying to build the safest bridge, might be we don't care about interpretability, we care about predictive accuracy. And these machine learning models happen to be the best models we have ever built <laughs> in terms of predictive accuracy. And so it raises a host of really important ethical questions, but also epistemological questions about whether or not, or what kind of knowledge or explanation we want in different domains. Um, uh, there was a, Barry and I, a couple of years ago, read a series of articles about this exact question, including um, a sort of one-sided debate between Peter Norvig, who is the head of research at Google, and Noam Chomsky, who needs no introduction. Uh, and, uh, Noam Chomsky apparently had said something at the 150th anniversary celebration of MIT to the tune of, I don't actually care if you can in, you know, predict with perfect accuracy when and where the bees will migrate. I want to know why bees migrate. Uh, so uh, want, wanting a different kind of explanation of phenomenon. Uh, on the other hand, we don't know how to give mechanical explanations in a lot of problem domains, and having the ability to predict well uh, serves us in a number of cases. And so they had a sort of conversation about what kind of knowledge this statistical prediction was, that there were more than one kind of it, um, and that it has different stakes in different parts of society is um, obviously true, <laughs> I guess. Are there uh, cases in mathematics where AI ent enters in an... I mean, because if you have a computer doing tasks where it can be interrogated, then there's a you can understand historically, and we, we know a lot about the history of that as to why people might not like it, but it seems like something you could get used to. But when it gets to be hidden under back propagating neural networks, it might get a little more problematic. I mean, in, in the domain that you spoke about, an additional feature is that some of these predictive features become a proxy for race, and that's really, you know, like where do you live? And so 
one of the things that people have really objected to in automatic sentencing guidelines is if it's a proxy for race, it's like the worst kind of bigoted judge without a recourse. Exactly. Yeah. But in, in mathematics, do you, do you, are there uses of AI, neural network, deep learning? Nothing comes to mind, but there are a lot of mathematicians here. <laughs> You know, um, this might be a good time to shift over to the question session. Um, I would just like to read a short passage from Barry's book, Imagining Numbers, before we do that. He says, even when we have, even when we have palpable historical evidence, it may be hard to weigh the importance of that evidence correctly for the most minute shifts of thought, a change in notation, the appearance or disappearance of what would seem to be a harmless metaphor may signal the evolutionary beginning of a new species of idea. I mean, I think the, at least from the history of science, I would say pedagogy uh, is the important thing. Um, that's part of how you learn to imagine it because you are if you study kind of school and you learn from uh, people uh, around you. The other thing is that uh, there's one uh, historian of mathematics, uh, Donald McKenzie, that said, and I think he's probably right about it, that uh, mathematicians are, in fact, uh, the group from sciences that are, do most of the work in face-to-face -face interactions and most, most, most any other sciences, mm -hmm. that you actually only learn something in mathematics if you talk to people, uh, that you almost never learn uh, or what you, what you can learn from just picking up you know, a published paper without ever talking to people in that field is minimal. Uh, so the degree to which mathematics is in fact a conversation, uh, is done in conversation, is a part, is a huge part of this communal uh, imagining. Doesn't that make the inner circle, outer circle problem very serious? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Maybe technology <laughs> mitigates that to some degree. I don't think so. I think it actually reifies the problem. So um, there was the development of this uh, sort of early expert system called Maxima that was supposed to do for mathematicians or take over for mathematicians all of their sort of drudgery of manipulating symbols on the page, do it for them so that they could formulate more conjectures, have more creativity, work in problem domains in which they were not expertly trained. And it was just such a textbook story from a history of science perspective where nobody knew how to use the system. More than that, nobody knew at what point in mathematical problem solving the system might be valuable. Um, and at the end of the day, they had to get everybody together at users' conferences to teach people how to use it face-to-face. -face. It's kind of technical knowledge is not outside of the story that Alma just told. It's actually very much a part of it, in which access to technologies, knowledge of how to use them, knowledge of when they are useful, and then the ability to incorporate them into your problem-solving practice requires you have access, again, to training, to the technologies themselves, and to the community that makes them meaningful. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually writing a book chapter about Maxima as we speak, so I would, I'm serious about talking to you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, right, so, so um, the reason that we have not relegated all of these mathematical practices to the merely mechanical because we have built computer systems that can do them is because for the mathematical community they still place value on the kind of knowledge and capability that comes along with learning how to do them. Um, that could change. I don't know when or why. Um, but the designation that something is merely mechanical doesn't just come along with having a machine that does it. It comes along with a whole set of valuational practices about what kind of knowledge and practice and training one ought to have in order to be a mathematician. Um, we don't really learn to sort of do long division in the same way that we once did. So that's a designation of merely mechanical that's been more sort of comprehensive in its vision. But we're, I mean, we're still in the very early history of what's happening with computers and mathematics, I think. So that may yet come or not, depending on how those valuations continue or change. In another field, you know, there's a very striking example for medical students anatomy, 
was the central course. It was the organizing core of knowledge. And now almost every medical school in the United States, at least, it doesn't teach anatomy anymore. You, if you do it, you do parts of it on the computer in, in simulated form. And something that was, was thought to be central is now barely peripheral. I mean, one of the best examples of that is the new math, right? There was, in a sense, it was an attempt, uh, and there's a book written by Christopher Phillips about the new math in, in the United States, but an attempt to teach school mathematics, which will be somehow closer to track how, you know, how mathematics, what, mathematics, what mathematics actually is, and it failed uh, terribly, uh, failed terribly so. Um, but uh, but, it's, but the, I think that the place of teaching mathematics in school is something that's been uh, a source for debate and will continue to be a source of uh, debate. Right? There, there's always, it's kind of a, always going to be an argument of what's the right way to teach mathematics uh, uh, for, for kind of school ages. Part of the point that Chris Phillips makes in that book is that um, um, mathematics, as you say, it, mathematics education in, in sort of primary, secondary, and high school isn't necessarily meant to train you to be a mathematician. It's supposed to train you how to think properly. And so it makes, it's a very political debate how mathematics should or would be taught, especially during the Cold War, because it was tied up with this, not with being a good mathematician, but with being a good American who you know, thinks and reasons properly, right? Um, so but, mathematical but it was in the yeah, Cold that War that we had the new map, yeah. and it's now after the Cold War that we have a much more formalistic approach. So I, I don't think the connection to the Cold War actually worked. Well, that's how it looked in that moment. But that this is a political conversation in other contexts, in different ways, of course. Yeah. There is a question of uh, which person, uh, probably some people will learn better in face-to-face -face interaction. I think that the, what the literature has shown, however, is that you have to have face-to-face -face interaction. So there is a certain kind of learning, and it's not just learning, it's learning what it means to be a mathematician, how to go about reasoning about mathematics, how to explain a new, for, a new mathematical discovery. Um, this is part of what, it, and, and you're probably going to do it in the next few years in graduate school. Uh, but I think that what you see in the literature is, is, um, is that almost um, the, the example after example of people uh, that it's only when they become part of a certain kind of community ex of expertise uh, is that when they really become, you know, when they come to face to face interaction part of the community is that they really kind of uh, become an expert himself uh, of part of it. I don't know that there is. Like I said, a certain kind of formula. You're a mathematician, so you want a formula. But I don't know that there is a certain kind of formula to exactly how to divide uh, the divide your time. I mean, people in the audience can probably answer that. Much. Join me in thanking the.